Every day, 13 Christians worldwide are killed because of their faith. Every day, 12 churches or Christian buildings are attacked. Every day, 12 Christians are unjustly arrested or imprisoned. Another five are abducted. That, all according to the 2021 World Watch List, which is the annual report from our friends over at Open Doors. And uh, they track the top 50 countries where Christians are the most persecuted for one thing, for following Jesus Christ. And I, I, this, I hate to report, but it's, reach, it's at historic levels. Why is that? Well, joining us now uh, to talk more about this, Dr. David Curry. He is the president and CEO of Open Doors USA. David, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me on. All right, let's. Uh, you you listed three main reasons three three main reasons that we're seeing this uh, rise, actual rise in persecution of Christians around the world. What, what's driving this? Well, the three things that stand out from this year's data. The first is that extremists are using COVID. They're using the lockdowns. And they're using the premise of it as a reason, as a way to gain ground. So you see in Nigeria extremists that were already targeting Christian communities. Now those Christian communities are more or less trapped. They have an ineffectual government in Nigeria, in, in Burkina, Burkina Faso, in this region, and you're seeing a massive spike in violence there, up 60 percent worldwide, most of it in Nigeria by Boko Haram or the Fulani herdsmen. So you have those kinds of things happening. You have governments and and uh, and that could be local government as well, and, and uh, organizational structures that are denying aid to Christians. In India, 115,000 uh, individuals we've identified who have been withheld aid because they were Christian. India has a big challenge, largest democracy in terms of people, but right now they're they're having major human rights issues, and it's all around their nationalistic agenda to make India Hindu, completely Hindu, even though there's a lot of pluralism in that country. They're trying to force out minority religions, and of course there's 65 million Christians in India who are suffering because of it, and that's why they're up in the World Watch List again this year at number 10, which is really shocking considering what it takes to get into the top 10. So you have those kinds of dramas, and then, of course, it's rising because of China and their surveillance state that's being targeted at religious minorities, prime of which is Christians. It's also happening to Uyghur Muslims in the northwest of the country, dramatically and tragically targeting that smaller group, but in, in, in a very dramatic way. We want to always note that, that it's not just about persecution of Christians in China, it's about persecution of all religious Right. Uh, per, uh, per expressions there, but right now you've got a hundred million Christians in China who are who are being surveilled. They're being tracked. They're being scored in the citizenship score, and 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 that is affecting their ability for the kids to get into the schools they need to, to hold jobs, to even travel by plane. Because if you go to church, the communist system is telling you. You're not a good Chinese citizen. That is the exact opposite of what we know to be true. These are great citizens in China. They're they're you know building great families. They're helping with drug issues. They're serving their country. They love China. They want to be good citizens. The Communist Party has a problem with that. You mentioned uh, David Nigeria. Nigeria, uh, number nine on your top ten list, I think, uh, where they come in. They're number two when it comes to violence, and number one in terms of the number of Christians killed. Three hundred, three thousand five hundred thirty that we know of that died because of their Christian faith in Nigeria. Uh, really, Nigeria is driving this increase overall. When you look at the violence there, that has made the world a more volatile place. It has. I mean, in some places, COVID has restricted the ability of people to, to act out violently, at least for a period of time it did. Not so in Nigeria. I don't have to tell you. You're an expert in, in what's going on there, but your viewers will need to know this is a region that is ready to tip over into chaos. And it's all because the government has looked the other way on these attacks on Christians. 
Uh, the President Buhari, I think, has been negligent, to say the least. Uh, he's allowed these attacks to go on. They will say they're trying to support these Christian communities. They'll send people up there with, uh, with guns that don't have bullets. I mean, that level of incompetence. And the civil authorities are not protecting these Christians. And uh, they're getting more sophisticated all the time. I related to what was happening with ISIS in the north of Iraq years ago, where you have a, this escalation where they show it, they, they show their hand as to what they're trying to do and who they're targeting, and they begin to stretch out and they want to claim territory. Now we're talking about attacks into Niger. Burkina Faso is now on the list rising in just three years it came on to us now it's number 32 it's all around but uh, uh, Boko Haram and the Fulani who are attacking Christians in this region we could see it the Biden administration is going to need to step up and 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 really pressure Buhari and these these coalitions in Africa to try to to take care of this so civil authorities are protecting Christians and Christian churches you're listening to Washington Watch. I'm your host, Tony Perkins. Glad you're with us. Dr. David Curry, my guest, uh, Open Doors USA, releasing their World Watch list for 2021. Uh, you can find out more. Go to the website, TonyPerkins.com. Follow the links over. And by the way, folks, this is a, an organization worthy of your support. Our family supports. It's one of a handful of ministries that uh, my family personally supports because of the great work that they do, not just in tracking this. It's a great resource to kind of get a snapshot of what's happening around the world, but they actually bring assistance to persecuted believers, uh, along with other fine organizations that we support as well, Voice of the Martyrs and others. But uh, I appreciate the work that David and his team do. David, you mentioned the incoming Biden administration in Nigeria. I'm very concerned because the predominant view, not just here in the United States, but of many other governments, uh, and, and even within the State Department, we had to work really d hard uh, because we, we, the, the view was shared by the secretary, but not within the bowels of the State Department, so to speak. Um, many believe that this is a scarcity of resources, that this is not a religious conflict, but it's a conflict over resources in Nigeria. You're right. It's the way they, they map this conflict. They have the way of mapping it where they say, well, this is, these are bad actors, these are mafioso, these are criminal elements. But all you have to really do is look at what these folks are saying. There's an ideology. It's taught in madrasas around the world that is a, a theology of a, attack. It's that Christians and others are infidels unless they follow this most virulent form of Islam. Islamic leaders have to continue to address this. But until then, what we're going to have to do is have civil society. That's what they're there for. Militaries. Uh, governments who can take action against these terrorist organizations who are driven by a philosophy and their theology is clear. So we have seen past governments overlook that. Well, it's not really that they're attacking Christians. Christians are just the victims of it. They're telling us this is what they're going to do. They're going into cities in the Borno state. It's just, uh, have a, we have an interview on our Open Doors USA site with a woman named Afordia, they go into their city, they cut off cell phone ability so that they can isolate the village. They tell all the Muslims, stay in your house, we're looking for Christians. And then they go and they murder them and they steal the medical supplies and the food supplies. So we have to follow what people are doing and what they're saying. And I think that should make it clear. But you're right, there's reason for concern. I'm hopeful, let's hope anyway, I should say, and pray. But, uh, they're going to follow through on this. Hope and pray. Uh, you you Hope made a pray. you made a comment regarding the list, and um, th there's some positive signs. Of you uh, yeah. Before I get to this, uh, your statement about the list, I, I want to quickly hit on some um, to to hit a couple of uh, uh, positive things. Sudan. Um, there's some positive developments there. You recognize that in your report, but you said there's still problems. Yeah, because there are cultural uh, insets here where, where people, we, we measure persecution in the private sphere of life as well as the national sphere of life. We're measuring violence 
and also areas where there may not be as much violence, but there's a squeeze. So we're measuring all sides of it. And so what you're saying is not necessarily from the hands of government, but some of it is cultural from the, you know, the, the private sector, if you will. That's right. That's right. It may be that a, that a Muslim becomes a follower of Jesus, reads the Bible, decides for themselves what they think about it, and their family uh, begins to push them out and maybe even in many cases attacks them. So that's we rank that as persecution. It may not be tied to the Sudanese government. But let's be clear, the move forward to, to get rid of the blasphemy laws – is a very, very important step, and I hope they'll lead the way for other countries yes. as well, because this is used as a pretext for a lot of vigilante justice against Christians. Yes, I met with the Prime Minister uh, last February, and, and that certainly was the, the goal as we see them making these steps that others may follow in, their, uh, in the wake of their actions, and, and we're hopeful that it will re- result in positive economic activity in that country because of these moves to embrace religious freedom. I, I, I want to go to this uh, the quote. You said that you might think the list is all about oppression, but the list is really all about resilience. I, I actually think I want you to unpack that because I find that as a source of encouragement to believers here in this country as well. Well, I think people need to understand we're not saying that we're going to stop persecution. The way to do that is for people to stop talking about Jesus, stop practicing their faith. We don't want that. We're not going to stop talking about it. Uh, And what you will see on the list is you're going to find people of deeper faith, of people who have paid the price, and it's and they found that, that their faith is, is, is strong, it's resilient. These are heroes of the faith. And in many places, not all, we have to be clear, but in some anyway, the church is gaining strength in the midst of persecution. And it, it gains strength when they, can, when they can stay in community, when they have access to Scripture. These are critical things. And when they know that they're not alone, when they, the church loses strength in persecutions because they're totally isolated, cut off, they lose the power of Scripture, so they, all kinds of crazy ideas take root, and before long it shrivels up and it can die. So we want to strengthen the church. We want to stand with them. I think it's so critical that the people know they're not alone. Yeah, They're not alone. And some of these folks are sitting in prison. They've been accused of blasphemy in Pakistan and other places. They're on death row, and they don't even know what they did except, except Jesus and talk about it. And uh, so that, that's where we want to stand with these folks and, and in other ways as well. David, we're almost out of time, but I want to ask you one final question. As believers here in the United States, what can we do to stand with our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted for no other reason than they name the name of Jesus Christ and they will not be silent about their faith in him? Yeah, and let's, I would say real quick, let's not be silent. Share these stories. Tell the story. Pray. Every church, every Sunday, pray in somewhere for somebody who's on this list, some country, some person, some family. Uh, we can, I think, stand with our brothers and sisters who, who are paying the price for their faith. That's what we're called to do. David Curry, thank you so much for joining us. As always, great to talk with you and deeply, deeply appreciate the work that you and Open Doors USA does. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, Dr. David Curry. To find out more, go to the website, TonyPerkins.com, and do pray for the persecuted. Pray for the persecuted and, and be inspired by their courage. And as David said, we must speak out. We cannot shrink back in the face of the cancel culture that we face here. We might be knocked off of social media, but right now we're not going to be put in prison like many of these followers of Christ, nor have our families executed in front of us. We've got to be bold in our faith for Jesus Christ. But you notice what he said? It takes community. We've got to be in community. We've got to be in the Word. Our strength is not in ourselves, but as Paul says in Ephesians 6, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. That's the source of our strength. 